Welcome to The Savvy Sauce, where we have practical chats for intentional living. I'm your host, Laura Duggar, and I'm so glad you're here. The principles of honesty and integrity that Sam Lehman founded his business on continue today over 55 years later at Sam Lehman Chevrolet Buick in Eureka. Owned and operated by the Birchy family, Sam Lehman in Eureka appreciates the support they've received from their customers all over central Illinois and beyond. Visit them today at laymangm.com. Beth Rosenbleeth is my guest today, and she is the mother to three boys and the founder of Days with Gray, which offers play-based learning resources and activity ideas for parents to connect better with their kids and enjoy necessary breaks. She is full of simple and creative suggestions that will inspire you to try one of these prompts right away. Here's our chat. Welcome to the Savvy Sauce, Beth. Thanks, Laura. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I just want to start here. Can you tell us how Days with Gray originated? Yeah. Oh, gosh. It's so fun thinking back. So I was originally a teacher, and I taught through having my first and then I was pregnant with my second. And at that time, it felt like a good decision to we were moving homes and it felt like a good decision to become a stay at home mom. And, you know, it was a little scary because I had taught for over 13 years. But at the same time, it felt like exactly where I needed to be. And I I just needed to work out, you know, what that looked like. And you know, I remember being at home with my oldest and realizing how, although I was extremely grateful, these days felt really long, right? I mean, I remember sitting in the room that was the play space and just sitting on the couch and being like, oh my gosh, like, what do we do? Right. And so then I had my second and I, I remember taking those two boys on a neighborhood walk and like the giant chunk of the time spent was rolling pine cones down a hill. And now every time I go by that road, I, I think of the pine cones and, you know, we would walk to a nearby target and my oldest would just get out and roam the toy aisles and, and then we'd walk home. And again, that's like another three hour chunk of how to spend our day. So I remember hearing about how kids just knew what to do and how to play, but I also realized that a toddler and a preschooler and children, they needed just a little bit more than that. I realized quickly that I can't just expect my child to just be self-entertained for the day. So I saw a need of mix of ideas how to spend the day with kids and also a place to know that I wasn't so alone in feeling like how I was spending these days. And so with that, I I created Days with Gray. Well, and I just love your vision because you're able to articulate different elements that I know I desire to be true in our home. And I'm guessing many others feel the same way. And even in your bio, where it talks about strategically introducing more play into our days, and you do that in hopes of parents better connecting with their children through play-based learning. And you also put in all while getting more breaks. And I think all of that is vitally necessary. And we've done episodes previously about parenting for the relationship. Sandra Stanley's episode on January 9th comes to mind. So I'll link that in our show notes. But I can already tell Beth that you're going to help us live this out where we're actually enjoying parenting at the same time our kids are enjoying childhood. And that's such a win-win. But just to add one more layer, how do you personally enjoy work and motherhood during the same season? This is all so great. And that, that podcast episode was excellent. So I find that children in general like to be close and they crave connection. And so allowing our children to spend time with us, I like to put it on the front end. So one one problem that we came across is that when I had three littles, we were coming downstairs and I was very tired and I wanted to wake up. And so, you know, I would just 
be like, okay, you know, let's just watch a show. Well, like one show turned into two shows. And then what I noticed is that when we turned it off, we didn't really know what to do next, right? Like they they were cranky because the TV was off. I was kind of cranky because I felt like I hadn't done much. So in turn, I was like, you know what? Let me put my teacher hat on here. And what would happen if we started the morning together, not so much separated in different rooms watching a show? What happens if we start the morning together and the kids come down to something very simple on the tabletop to play with while I wash the bottles, prep breakfast, and drink my hot tea. And we started calling these breakfast invitations. And that's what they were. They were simple learning games for the kids to come down to start their morning with play. That would lead to more play. But what I noticed with this is, yes, there were fun games for kids to play. But I also realized that it was the connection that was really kickstarting our day. Up front, putting in the time together at the breakfast table really helped everybody's bucket become filled, right? They had my attention, but in a casual way, they might be sorting three different colors. And as I'm washing the bottle, I might say, wow, looks like a lot of you have a lot of red toys over there. You know, so they were getting my attention, but not in a way that it was hovering. And that connection has really set the stage for when they were younger and now as they're growing older, being able to dedicate about 10 to 15 minutes at the front end without my phone or without my email and distractions has really set the day for play and the tone for our family. The other thing that has really helped me with motherhood, like you asked, is that for myself, thinking about what can I do with my kids and what can I not do with my kids. And from the very start, somebody gave me the advice that when you have time away, you don't wanna fill it with chores. And so I had to get very focused on what I can do with my kids around and what I cannot do with my kids around. And this looks very different for each family. So one example would be for me, I realized that although it's exhausting, I have learned to like going grocery shopping with my children with when they were younger. We would go every Wednesday, right? Wednesday we got paid, Wednesday we went grocery shopping. But I realized pretty quickly that I cannot do a spreadsheet when the kids are around, right? It's loud and it's messy and I can't concentrate. So finding early on what tasks you can complete with kids around and what tasks you cannot is really important because it helps you kind of protect that downtime for when it's nap time or when it's quiet time to really do something that you enjoy, even if that's just like sitting on the couch and looking out the window, but it allows you to decompress. That is brilliant, Beth. I love that. And can you just remind us currently, what are the ages of your children? So right now they are five and a half, seven and a half and nine. And we started doing this when they were about maybe four, three. And actually I think he was a newborn. So it was, which I don't encourage being over ambitious with a newborn. I think it's extremely important when you have a newborn to press pause and take care of yourself and take care of your baby. And then when you're ready, you have tools around you to help you. But I think they I think they're about three and two and and newly born. And that's helpful to think of the different stages. And when you talk about these breakfast invitations, could you just share a couple examples? Oh, yeah. So it's very simple, right? Busy mom, not a lot of time to prep. So an example would be just to put a sheet of white paper out and maybe color in three different boxes, red, blue and yellow, and then collect a few toys and your child can color sort them. And as they're color sorting, you can then mention words like primary colors or how many more, how many total, uh, which color looks like it has the most, which color has the least in a very casual risk-free way as your child is color sorting. That is very doable. So I love that example. And so you've talked about this connection, this first time coming together at breakfast, but then what are your thoughts on independent play for children? You know, independent play, the benefits are that it builds confidence for children to test out, okay, I really like this. No, I don't like this. And nobody is directing their play, right? And when a child is independently playing, they are the decision makers. But what most caregivers don't realize that are parents or grandparents or babysitters, what they don't realize is that focus 
tends to be about double the child's age. So when we have a three-year-old engaged in independent play, that's probably about a six-minute window. And I think that's really important for caregivers to, to know and recognize because we feel like we're not doing it right if our children aren't You know, you see a snippet, a picture of something on Instagram and it's like, man, I really wish my kids would play like that. How do they, how do, well, the reality is that might just be a six minute window where the child was fully engaged of making the decisions and that's a huge win. So we have to see these small windows as wins rather than feeling like we're constantly not improving on the amount of time. Play takes practice. and. As a parent, I also realized that play can be loud and it can be messy and it could be chaotic. And I think that's a challenge for us parents as well, too, because we want our home to be a relaxing, comforting place. And at the same time, children have lots of energy, right, that they're releasing in lots of different ways. So to know one that play takes practice and to understand the the age time about focus for a child is really important to keep in mind. And the other thing is that play takes a lot of turns. And us as adults, we don't really understand where our child is going with something, or maybe we see a lot of repeated play patterns. But all of that is really what it's doing is connecting different like learning paths in the brain. And so the more a child repeats the same play pattern, the more they're expanding their knowledge, right? I was reading back a post this morning and it was when my children were much younger and I was explaining how I watched my three-year-old go from sorting pumpkin erasers to then moving them into a fire engine. And then I observed him creating this circus that they were about to have. And then I watched him transport the pumpkin erasers onto the back porch, put them on his tricycle and move them all around the back deck. (laughs) So it's just interesting when we actually watch a child play, how much goes into this time of focus and how much, how, how self-directed play needs to happen. Because I could have never told him, okay, we're having a circus. Let's put these pieces together. And then, you know, okay, now let's go outside. It had to evolve on his own terms. And that's really important for developing self-confidence, self-worth, and understanding likes and dislikes. And the other thing is like, just to think about child's play as a giant building, right? Like we can't get to the 11th floor without getting into the lobby. And our role as caregivers, we're kind of like building that lobby, right? We're building that foundation. We're building that like play time into the day. We're building in this like downtime and this, predictable routine that kids know, okay, here's when I play. Well, if I want to go to the next thing, here's where I need to put things away before I move on. And we do that through a few different ways. We do that through breakfast invitations, spending maybe 10 minutes on the front end with a child, open-ended toys that children can be playing with, and being patient, really, really understanding how much time a child focuses for their age or stage of life. And now a brief message from our sponsor. Sam Lehman Chevrolet Buick in Eureka has been owned and operated by the Birchie family for over 25 years. A lot has changed in the car business since Sam and Stephen's grandfather, Sam Lehman, opened his first Chevrolet dealership over 55 years ago. If you visit their dealership today, though, you'll find that not everything has changed. They still operate their dealership like their grandfather did, with honesty and integrity. Sam and Stephen understand that you have many different choices in where you buy or service your vehicle. This is why they do everything they can to make the car buying process as easy and hassle-free as possible. They are thankful for the many lasting friendships that began with a simple, welcome to Sam Layman's. Their customers keep coming back because they experience something different. I've known Sam and Steven and their wives my entire life, and I can vouch for their character and integrity, which makes it easy to highly recommend you check them out today. Your car buying process doesn't have to be something you dread. So come see for yourself at Sam Layman Chevrolet Buick in Eureka. Sam and Steven would love to see you, and they appreciate your business. Learn more at their website, laymaneureka.com, or visit them on Facebook by searching for Sam Layman Eureka. 
You can also call them at 309-467-2351. Thanks for your sponsorship. And it seems like that breakfast invitation, going back to that again, sometimes your recommendations include process art where it's not like you set up a step-by-step craft for them to complete, but you lay out a prompt for them just to enjoy the process. And so how do you see children benefiting from this process art? Yeah. So when we think of art, we often think mess, right? I mean, it's kind of, there's a lot of parts and pieces to art and it could get, it could get pretty messy. But when we watch our kids truly deep into what they're creating, it's often silent. Art helps children practice self-control, which develops over time. We are going to know going into it that if it's our first time painting, our child's probably going to try to paint their hands. So we want to set them up for success. But it helps practice self-control. It increases concentration. It increases creativity. It provides an outlet for emotions. If a child has a lot on their mind and they can express their emotions through art, that's really helpful for them. Um, It allows a child to take risks. Often children are told like, yes, you can do this. No, you can't do this or given a choice, right? But when they are doing something like process art, they're allowed to take risks. Well, what happens if I mix the blue, the blue with the red? Or what happens if I mix all of the colors together? Or, you know, when you're when you're cutting a piece of paper, what happens when I keep cutting and, and now the papers, you know, you see the paper go from a square to just little pieces. So your child's really developing a sense of self through process art and discovering What makes them tick, right? What direction they like to go in the art that really makes them feel like proud of their work. And that's another important thing with art is when a child, I've learned in my education career, when a child comes to you with some art that they have created a great phrase or something great to say is, oh, tell me about this right? Because then they can tell you about what they created rather than making an assumption. Oh, I love this airplane. And then they're like, oh, no, that wasn't an airplane, you know? So giving them the chance to explain their art is another great piece and tool from like going from process art to explaining it. Uh, And then we have like communication and vocabulary skills that are developing as well. I love some of the process art that you've done in your own home. So when you think back to a few of your favorite breakfast invitations that were specifically around process art. What are a couple examples? Oh, gosh, it's so fun to look back at pictures because I see so much. So, you you know, when the boys were really little, process art really could be a two part. It could be go collect sticks, come inside, paint the sticks (laughs) and go outside and collect rocks come inside and paint the rock. So I have a lot of great memories with just being able to explore, you know, painting things that we find around the house or things that we have outside. And I didn't figure out this trick until my um, third child. But one excellent painting tip for toddlers is you take a giant under the bed storage bin and then choose a few colors that mix well together. So maybe you only put like a little bit of red and a little bit of yellow and allow your toddler to paint inside the storage bin because then it's more contained and they can just make discoveries of like mixing different colors. And if you wanted to, you can then put a piece of paper on top and and kind of like stamp the design. But that was a great tip of when I was painting with toddlers to keep the keep the paint inside the bin and let him explore color mixing. Oh, that's so good. You're giving us something to try with a variety of ages. Yeah. And you know what? Painting's not for everybody. So uh, um, just to expand a little bit on art, art means so many different things. It can also be as simple as um, I have this winter art activity, which I know now we're in spring, but it's a giant mitten. And what you do is you just tear up different pieces of tissue paper, and then you put a little bowl of glue and water next to it. And they're literally painting the tissue paper onto the picture of the mitten using a paintbrush and using the glue and water. That's a great mess-free way to allow a child to explore and and dive into some process art. But, you know, the one thing that we didn't talk about, too, is that how art really helps those fine motor skills. It's strengthening their children's hands. It's helping them with hand-eye coordination and holding a steady hand. So a lot of times, 
Art can just be including maybe a hole puncher and paper and allowing a child to explore that or a fresh pack of markers. I mean, I'm 43 and I still get giddy off of a fresh marker. There's a lot of different ways to do art that aren't limited to painting if painting's not your thing. Well, as parents, when we intend to encourage play and art and reading in our homes, do you have any word of caution for what you think we should also be careful to avoid? I mean, avoiding glitter is always a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have, um, gosh, in my head, glitter and glitter glue. I remember my middle was, he was old enough to, to where I thought he wouldn't do this, but young enough to where it was still pretty innocent. But I remember walking into the bathroom because glitter glue also is glow in the dark if you buy a certain kind. And we would go to Office Depot. I would need a supply for something for Days with Gray. And we'd go to Office Depot and, you know, they would convince me that we need glitter glue. And I'd be like, okay, you're right. It'd be a great addition. Get it home. My three-year-old took it into the bathroom covered the entire bathroom with glitter glue because he was trying to see how it lit up. Um, I didn't notice he was doing that and then obviously walked in and um, saw glitter glue everywhere. So glitter and glue are kind of my glitter and glitter glue are my two like words of caution. <laughs> You've been warned. Um, but no, other than that, I think that I think it's important to stay true to yourself as a parent. If there's something that you're just a no about, then then it's totally fine. And there are other people that will come into your child's life that may be the yes. So maybe you cannot handle paint, but maybe grandma can. Or maybe you are not someone that really enjoys clay and molding clay. Uh, but but you might have somebody who comes, a caregiver that comes and watches your child that does. So just remember that you, you know, you can only offer your child the experiences that feel good to you. And there'll be other people that will help you along the way for the other experiences. And there's also sensory play. So how do you define sensory play and what are its benefits? Well, so just like art and independent play, sensory play has similar benefits. The main difference with sensory play is that you're adding a lot of different textures into the play, and texture is something that really stimulates the brain. Children remember what they can touch, what they can do, uh, not so much what's just being told to them or said to them. So sensory play is something that stimulates the brain and I find has the most bang for your buck, so to say. Children tend to really zone into a sensory activity. So you get a little bit more time out of it. I say start simple. Start with some water and a little, you know, so if you're talking about the little ones, you want to make sure you're you're watching them and supervising them with water in a bin. And you might just add a little bit of bubbles. And my favorite is like measuring cups and funnels and just watching kids pour and scoop and and see how they react when they see the water go through the funnel. And less is more, right? You don't need, you don't need to get this bin and fill it up with soapy water. And then I think one one funny thing that I catch myself doing, even as a parent, even though I know better, is like you see your child really engaged in in scooping and pouring bubbly water, let's say, and then you're like, oh. Oh, they also need they also need this uh, this scooper. I'm gonna go get the scooper, and then and then you like walk over and you're like, Kira, you you add this too, and then you realize you just totally disrupted their play and what they were thinking and what they were doing. And so I believe in less and more. So offer a few different supplies, maybe two measuring cups and a funnel, and then just kind of back off and and see where your child goes with it. And sometimes I like to keep one thing on the side. So see where your child goes with it until it looks like play is coming to an end. And then maybe you're pulling out that that squirt bottle and you're like, oh, I just found this. I wonder, could you, do you have any use for this? You know, playing it casual, cool, and seeing if, if they're interested in extending the play that way. Um, my other parenting hack is that many toys can be frozen, I found, and that adds a whole nother element to sensory play because, you know, if you put a little plastic toy in a, you put water in a muffin tin, add a plastic toy, add a little bit more water, pop it in the freezer. Well, now you have something when you want it 
days from now. You know, you just have a lull in the afternoon. You take that muffin tin filled with frozen little colored plastic bears out of there. And that's in a sensory bin. Well, now your child's watching the ice melt and then the ice melts and then they start scooping and pouring the water and whatever was in the ice, you know, becomes now a toy. So it's really fun to watch that evolve as well. Oh my goodness. These are such great suggestions and it feels very doable where that's the one. Maybe I'll grab onto that and try that today. If this is your first time with us, I want to say welcome. We are so honored to have you join us and we would love to hear how you first heard about the Savvy Sauce. And if you've been here for a while, would you consider becoming a patron? By joining our group of patrons, you gain exclusive access to many bonus episodes and the new episodes and downloadable scripture cards just keep coming with your monthly patronage. You can join today by visiting thesavvysauce.com and clicking on our Patreon tab. Then click Join Patreon here. We're able to keep producing content due to the generosity of our patrons. So we want to sincerely say thank you. As we're talking about sensory play, it doesn't seem like there's a certain age where this stops. And even as adults, we still love being in water or different sensations. So it seems like this is one that could work throughout childhood. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because there's different stages. So I uh, I remember beans when my kids were little. And there's a lot of ones that you have to wait until your youngest is probably napping, right? Because you want to make sure that it's not going in their mouth. But I vividly remember bean sprouts going in between our decking. Our back deck had bean sprouts popping up, you know, a week later. And it just made me laugh because it it showed me like that was all the leftover beans from the sensory play that came out of the bin that we never cleaned up. And so then for a while, I needed a break from beans, right? And so now my ch- children are nine, seven, and five. And I'm overlooking at this bean bin that I've had in my office since October. And it has offered so much play. Like they will see me working. They come over, they just sit down. They just start scooping, pouring, touching, you know, scooping the beans through the funnel. And it offers a place for them to be close to me, but we can do different things. So we're parallel working. Wow. And all of these ideas, do they just come to you or was some of this taught to you through your degree and your master's degree? Oh yeah, it's it's funny. So this this is my brain. Um, first of all, <laughs> um, I think that's why I became a teacher because I really enjoy this. I really enjoy young children. I really enjoy, you know, watching them grow and the things that they say and that they come up with. And so I think that my education will never end. I I still try to take classes so that I can stay current on best practices. And as the world changes, so do children. And so. I am a lifelong learner in terms of child development, but it's absolutely a combination. Yes, it's who I am, but it also takes a lot of learning to keep your mind stimulated. What are some of the most helpful tips you did learn through your master's in teaching reading? Wow. So talk about learning still. I am constantly learning and relearning best practice reading strategies for kids because it that right now it's specifically a very hot topic that we are relearning a lot of things that we may have lost over the last few years. And one thing that would be helpful for parents is to know that we're talking more about sound awareness. That's the sounds that children hear when we begin to play around with words. And one simple way for a parent to to help a child with sound awareness or phonemic awareness at home would be like rhyming words, right? So you might have your coffee mug and you might be like, oh, I love this pug. No, wait, it's a slug. What is this again? Is it a tug? No, that's not a rug. Oh, it's my mug. You know, like just having playful conversations that kind of share how you can manipulate the beginning sounds of words. So kids start to become more aware of like how rhyming words connect. That is so fascinating and things that we can just do in our regular conversation. But then if we also love to incorporate reading into our own homes, do you have any favorite picture or chapter books for children? 
Oh, that's such a great question. So read alouds are so great for kids. And when we were going through the pandemic, that's when I really spent time reading to my kids. Towards the older end, I'd say a great read aloud was the classic mouse in the motorcycle. You know, it's a little dated in terms of what's happening in there, but it's just this classic that my kids really ended up enjoying more than I thought that they ever would. And in terms of best picture books, there are so many great picture books. I think we're we're reading one called My Five-Year-Old's Really Into Sir Pancake and Something Waffle. It's just a really funny little tale. I think the best thing when you when you read with children, no matter which picture book you have, when I was a teacher, you learn that you want to relate the book to other books you've read, the world around you, and your own life. And I think that that's something that's very doable for caregivers is to when you read a picture book to a child to know that there is just a simple way that you can connect it to their life, to the world around them or a book that you've read and making those connections just kind of deepen their understanding of what they just read. And also to know that you can leave those board books. My five-year-old's room is still covered in board books. In our world, I feel like we put age limits on toys and we put age limits on books and we we like to move children to the next phase. But it's important to remember that if we if we honor our child's interests, we can get a lot more out of everything we're trying to help them grow with. If we if we honor their interests and keep reading books about that, like, for example, my oldest are really into Minecraft. Well, they have so many Minecraft books, and it's so interesting to watch them have conversations about what they read or what we were at dinner, and they're talking about something that's going to be ending in April and for for a Minecraft. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't even understand it, but he understands it, and I think that's the whole point about reading with kids is that you can read about about so many different things that if you find something your child truly loves to read about it. It's it's great to show children that connection that, hey, we can learn more about this in the book. And, and especially in such a digital world, it's so great to go back to like books that you can learn more and show them that that's a great resource. I couldn't agree more with that. And you have fantastic ideas and you encourage parents not to reinvent the wheel, which I love because that saves us a lot of mental energy. So will you just share what are some of your best gift ideas for kids that are modestly priced? Yeah, well, my my favorite gift is, it sounds so silly and it might even feel silly to give as a gift, but it's one that lasts a lot longer than you'd ever, like I've had parents come back and say, that was just the best gift. Thank you. But you know, at the time they don't realize it. And what it is, is I like to just go to the dollar store and buy measuring cups and maybe a ladle and some funnels and maybe a container like those bath storage containers, you know, that have like the two side wide open spaces and give them some, some tools for sensory play. And, you know, you may need a little bit of explanation. You might need to like, you know, send a blog post over with it so they can understand how they can use these toys. But even putting these dollar store kitchen items into the bath at playtime is also another fun way to explore sensory play where you're not quite sure if you're ready for a bin, but you want to see how your child, like right now our bathtub has funnels in it, funnels and measuring cups. That's my favorite gift. It's a gift that you might not understand it wasn't on your list but your child will get so much use out of it and as your child is playing you can sit back on the sidelines and it also offers you a little bit of downtime well let's just continue with this idea sharing because parents may appreciate some last minute easter basket gift ideas and i can also link a couple of our previous articles written on the savvy sauce website that have links for easter basket gift ideas But Beth, from your perspective, what are your favorite recommendations for timeless toys and board games and art supplies for children? Great question. I I have a great post for Easter gifts for kids because we actually, we have a food allergy. And so we offer a few small items instead of a ton of candy because of that. So I think a fresh set of watercolor paints. Watercolor paints are great because they're less mess again. Um, A new set of chalk. Uh, There's a matching memory game that we really love. That's a great 
toy. There's these plus plus big. Plus plus makes a small size and a big size. We love the big size. My nine-year-old still plays with the big size. Those are great. Uh, magnetic tiles. That's another open-ended toy that will last for a very long time. Uh, we call them forever toys. I love that. The forever toys that you're talking about are the ones that are used by all of our children almost every day. Those magnet right. tiles have been worth their price over the right. years. <laughs> well, to get us started with a possible first action step after today's conversation, what is your recommended breakfast invitation for us to try this week? Okay, so go into that junk drawer that you have some random stickers stuffed in, right? Does everybody, I feel like we all kind of have half sticker sheets somewhere. And um, just tape down a piece of white paper on where your child has breakfast. And first of all, keep in mind, it might be a breakfast invitation, but people also really, families like to use them for maybe after a nap or uh, when you're trying to cook dinner. The key is that breakfast was hard for me. So I needed something during that time. You know, making dinner might be something that's hard for you. And so you'd want to insert it there as like a dinner invitation. But with that being said, put a piece of white paper down on the table. Then just put random stickers all over the paper and you're done. You're set up. Add a black marker, washable marker. If you want to do a pencil, you can do a pencil. Then when your child comes to the activity, just say, I wonder, circle the things you like. And then as your child is finding the things they like, they're expanding their vocabulary because you're. there might be a sticker that they're like, not unsure about what it is. So you're having conversations, you're expanding vocabulary. And then at the same time, your child is using their, their pencil grip and they're holding a steady hand to make the circle around the sticker of the object that they enjoy. If your child circles the entire sheet, that's pencil grip practice. That's the kind of practice we want for our three and four year olds rather than asking them to form letters. We want to first back up and we want them to form lines and we want them to be able to have a lot of free opportunities to hold these markers and pencils and writing utensils in their hands. So when our child is crossing out, an X is a really actually a difficult mark to make. So crossing out things they don't like, circling things they do like, it's very simple for a caregiver to set up. And it's also very beneficial for a child to start a discussion about. Well, it sounds like you have endless ideas. So <laughs> when we find ourselves needing some inspiration, where can we go online to learn more from you? So we are at Days with Gray just about everywhere. It's Days with G-R-E-Y, Days with Gray. Uh, you can find us on Pinterest, on dayswithgray.com for the website, Instagram, Facebook, and I am one, I always say I'm one DM and email away. I am here and I really enjoy helping families. So you can email me or DM me anytime. Wonderful. We will make it easy for everyone by adding these links in the show notes for today's episode. And Beth, you may already be aware that our podcast is called The Savvy Sauce because savvy is synonymous with practical knowledge. And so as my final question for you today, what is your savvy sauce? Laura, I'd say my savvy sauce is being able to use a muffin tin for about 79 other uses other than making muffins. <laughs> um, I, sometimes I just walk around the house and I'm like, how can we use this for play? But you can use it for your paints so that your paints can stay in different sections and then you have different circles to mix different colors in. Uh, you can add it to your sensory play. Maybe if you have a bean bin, you could toss in your muffin tin in there. You could put objects in the muffin tin and cover it with a sheet of tissue paper and allow a child to poke through and find the hidden object. You can freeze water in there. You could freeze toys in there. So I'd say I never knew before I became a parent that I would know how much I needed a muffin tin in my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have to say that may be one of my favorite <laughs> top ones of <laughs> savvy sauces. But thank you, Beth, for inspiring all of us to cultivate a flourishing home that does include play and connection. You've reminded us to be intentional to connect and to refresh with breaks. And your practical examples are just awesome. So thank you for being my guest today. Well, thanks for having me, Laura. This was fun. 
One more thing before you go. Have you heard the term gospel before? It simply means good news, and I want to share the best news with you. But it starts with the bad news. Every single one of us were born sinners, and God is perfect and holy, so he cannot be in the presence of sin. Therefore, we're separated from him. This means there's absolutely no chance we can make it to heaven on our own. So for you and for me, it means we deserve death and we can never pay back the sacrifice we owe to be saved. We need a savior. But God loved us so much, he made a way for his only son to willingly die in our place as the perfect substitute. This gives us hope of life forever in right relationship with him. That is good news. Jesus lived the perfect life we could never live and died in our place for our sin. This was God's plan to make a way to reconcile with us so that God can look at us and see Jesus. We can be covered and justified through the work Jesus finished if we choose to receive what he has done for us. Romans 10:9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to take our place. I pray someone today, right now, is touched and chooses to turn their life over to you. Will you clearly guide them and help them take their next step in faith to declare you as Lord of their life? We trust you to work and change the lives now for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are declaring him for me, so me for him you get the opportunity to live your life for him. At this podcast, we are called Savvy for a reason. We want to give you practical tools to implement the knowledge you have learned. So you're ready to get started? First, tell someone. Say it out loud. Get a Bible. The first day I made this decision, my parents took me to Barnes & Noble to get the Quest NIV Bible, and I love it. Start by reading the book of John. Get connected locally which basically means just tell someone who is part of the church in your community that you made a decision to follow Christ. I'm assuming they will be thrilled to talk with you about further steps, such as going to church and getting connected to other believers to encourage you. We want to celebrate with you too, so feel free to leave a comment for us if you made a decision for Christ. We also have show notes included where you can read scripture that describes this process. Finally, be encouraged. Luke 15.10 says, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The heavens are praising with you for your decision today. If you've already received this good news, I pray that you have someone else to share it with today. You are loved, and I look forward to meeting you here next time.